Cheap OLED versus expensive OLED. Can you spot the difference? So these are both OLED TVs, both made by the same company, and they're both 65 inches, but one is double the price. Why? So I'll spend some time going deep into the world of TVs on this channel to try and make things simple. So let me answer the big question, cheap OLED versus expensive OLED, what's the difference? Here are five things you should know. Thank you to Pet Libro for sponsoring a portion of this video. So I kick things off by saying that while OLEDs have come down significantly in price, one area that can still particularly be painful to your wallet is the price of the larger sets. It seems like the sweet spot for OLEDs really is around the 55 to 65 inch and 75 to 77 inch mark. So if you want something bigger, be prepared for your jaw to generally hit the floor. Typically sets going over that 77 inch threshold mark are going to see a huge bump in price and while 97 inch OLED TVs do exist, they're about the price of a used Tesla. So let's take the S90C from Samsung, for example. The jump from 55 to 65 inches is 300 bucks. I don't think that's too bad. But the jump from 65 to 77 is 800 bucks. That's noticeable. But from 77 to 83, so just a six inch difference, is $1,500. So only like you will know the size of the space you're looking to fill, but generally I think for most people that 75 to 77 inch mark is really a sweet spot for price and size. And you're getting that kind of quote, like big TV home theater feel while not going at least generally overboard on price. So the next thing we need to talk about is technology. Because these TVs, even when you decide on a general TV tech like OLED, there are bunch of subcategories that you'll soon kind of discover to do some research. We're talking QD OLED, W OLED, Micro OLED, B Series, C Series, G Series. Like, What does all of that mean? So basically the major OLED payment manufacturers are putting their own kind of spin on OLED to improve one of its biggest weaknesses and that's generally been brightness. So in the beginning it was very much like a Samsung versus LG story with Samsung going all in on QD OLED and Sony there as well and LG going all in on W OLED. But now seeing some of Samsung's top OLED TVs from now W OLED panel, I think it's fair to say that both are very good. So generally speaking, QD OLED is going to have the edge when it comes to brightness. So if you've got a room with a ton of natural light pouring in, you're going to want an OLED panel that can compete and make the images as sharp and vivid as possible. And while generally not as bright, uh, W OLED panels are still going to look great and also purport to suffer from less burn-in, which is one of the big concerns with OLED, although every manufacturer is taking giant steps to stop burn-in before it happens. Uh, of course, most major manufacturers with different SKUs and model numbers varying designs and features, but it's all just kind of generally speaking, the higher end trims are using higher end panels. For example, if I'm looking at 65 inch OLEDs, Best Buy have options from Sony with one is just 1500 bucks, while the other is 3300. There's a host of differences in features, but the big one driving up costs in the more expensive model is that it's using, probably guessed it, QD OLED. Uh, LG is something similar, with their B, C, and G lines. With their G series using MLA OLED, uh, basically an even brighter version of W OLED, they aims to compete with QD OLED, which is currently reserved for just LG's G series and their new M series. And look, it really comes down to this. If you want a brighter, better OLED experience, be on the lookout for that newer OLED technology. I wanna take a quick break. I know there can be a debate on which TV you should get, where well, there should be no debate is how much you love your pet. In particular, how much you love your cat. If you feed your cat wet food that has to be refrigerated, you know the problem with that it can't really ever go away because you gotta come back, take it out of the refrigerator and put it in the container. You can't use automatic feeders because it's gotta be refrigerated. And there hasn't really been a solution for that until now. So pet lovers, meet Polar by Pet Libro. And it does exactly what you'd expect. This will keep three days worth of wet food chilled, no need to add ice. They've got semiconductor cooling technology that's going to make this food last an incredibly long time. They keep temperatures below 50 degrees Fahrenheit, so the food is going to stay fresh. And also because they're a technology company, they can also automate this process. 
you get full smart app control. You can manage your pet meal times easily just opening the app and tapping a button. That'll make sure that your cat is getting the quality food that you want them to have while well, you can be off enjoying, you know, the world or whether or not you're just at work and want to make sure your cat's getting fed on time. Pet Libro has you covered. And when your pet is done, the lid is going to close. So you don't have to worry about bugs or other things uh, getting in there. They have what they're calling anti-pinch infrared lid sensor. So it will not close until no pet motion is detected for 10 consecutive seconds. And if a pet is detected while the lid is in the midst of closing, it's going to immediately stop and go back to open. Pet Libro's really thought of everything. If you want to learn more about Pet Libro or the Polar Wet Food Feeder, all the information you need will be down below. Next thing to consider when looking at just sort of the wide array of OLED TVs are features. Because in addition to different sizes and tech available, features are also going to differ vastly from manufacturer to manufacturer or even model to model. So because OLED is already considered to be kind of the upper echelon of TVs, most of the things you'd want are generally found on really any model with a few exceptions. So some of the base level OLEDs are limited to 60 Hertz. Not a huge issue if mostly you're watching just TV and movies. If you plan to use this for gaming, you probably want the extra versatility of a higher frame rate gaming experience. Uh, luckily, most OLEDs can handle this no problem. And in our research, even one of the most inexpensive OLEDs at Best Buy, the Sony Bravia A75L, fully supports 120 hertz. That kind of be a perfect pairing to go along with your PS5. Typically, higher-end TVs usually have more of these faster HDMI 2.1 ports to utilize, but even lower-end sets are quickly gaining this functionality uh, in almost all their ports. The higher-end OLED options will also feature some bonus things too. For example, LG's more flagship G lineup comes packed with a five-year panel warranty. Samsung's flagship S95D has speakers built in and support Dolby Atmos and uh, even 3D surround sound. Some extras you won't find on the less expensive side. So manufacturers are even experimenting with totally wireless setups which require a single power cable to the TV. We are paying a premium for that experience. Like this guy behind me, the LG M3. Some lower end OLEDs also have older and slower processors that could kind of be annoying if you rely on those for watching your content. Upscaling is handled differently depending on the manufacturer and processor. And there are also other host differences between models like design, bezel size, stand material, speakers, mounting options. It's the kind of stuff you'd expect. Well, I should stress that it is very hard to find a bad OLED experience. I think that kind of nicely segues me in to the question is video. And that's kind of all about price. What's the big difference between a budget OLED panel and a more expensive OLED panel? Besides the obvious stuff I just mentioned, it really comes down to the upgraded OLED technology. So the models equipped with them will get noticeably brighter, and if your TV is in a room with a lot of direct sunlight, it might be worth the extra investment to get something bright and vibrant during the day, but also you know, really pop when the sun goes down. On the flip side, if you can control lighting in your room, you definitely forego the higher end options and probably save some serious cash. I should also mention that going with the previous generation or two is usually a great way to kind of like hack the system. Now, there may be some differences from generation to generation. Buying last year's model can be an awesome way to save some money. For example, LG's newest G4 is a phenomenal TV using MLA OLED technology to get way brighter. But if you control the lighting in your room and rather have a bigger TV for less money, go with a 77 inch LG C3. Still have an awesome set and save a thousand bucks or get the 77 inch version of last year's G3 for just a little bit more than the price of a 65 inch G4. It all depends on what compromises you wanna make. And finally, I do have one more thing that I should share, kind of a curveball to the story. Now this most definitely does not apply to everyone, and it is certainly not a perfect solution. If you're primarily watching movies by yourself, and you want to experience an absolutely incredible display technology for the price of a flagship TV, should mention that Apple's Vision Pro is something to consider. Now look, that device is plagued with its own compromises and issues, but since we're talking about OLED TVs, it's worth mentioning that this headset is a cutting edge micro OLED and while Vision Pro isn't necessarily for me right now, I loved watching movies and shows on it. 
Not only could you make the screen as big or small as you like, but also allowed for spatial experiences like spatial and 3D content that were insanely cool. Again, not for everyone, but if you're someone who watches movies and TV by themselves, it's worth considering. Now listen, again, I wanna reiterate, any version of OLED is going to be really good. And when you have MLA, you have QD OLED, you're getting really bright panels. And if you're gonna have a TV for years, it might be worth the extra investment. But like I mentioned earlier, I have an LG G2 in a very bright environment, and it's just W OLED, and I have never once wanted a brighter set. But when I see something like the M3 behind me or LG's G4, I can notice the brightness. But generally not unless I see the sets side by side. So I think the best advice I can give is get the best TV you can get without stretching your budget. Have a price in mind and stick with it. And if you go OLED, I guarantee you, you're gonna get a great TV.